Today's passage is the end of Ecclesiastes, and here at the very end, the quester, the the author or sage of Ecclesiastes, speaks of the end, and not capital T, the capital E, and cap, you know the end, but but our end. He talks about death, and this is uh, something we want to avoid, a topic we want to avoid. And one of the things that Ecclesiastes has been so helpful for me is by showing that those topics that we try to avoid, that that avoidance doesn't really do us a lot of good. And actually uh, talking about them and even facing them head on as much as we can is really helpful. And this is what the Ecclesi- what Ecclesiastes offers us for considering our own end and the the stage of life that leads to the end, which, you know, are later years. And a point Ecclesiastes wants to make is they themselves are not the end. They're this whole other adventure. And that's the promise that we all have, no matter what age we are. And um, that's what God has in store for you today. Blessings. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, beginning of verse 3. Oh, how sweet the light of day, and how wonderful to live in the sunshine. Even if you've been a long time, don't take a single day for granted. Take delight in each light-filled hour, remembering that there will also be many dark days and that most of what comes your way is smoke. You who are young, make the most of your youth. Relish your youthful vigor. Follow the impulses of your heart. If something looks good to you, pursue it. But know also that not just anything goes. You have to answer to God for every last bit of it. Live footloose and fancy free. You won't be young forever. Youth lasts about as long as smoke. Honor and enjoy your creator while you're still young, before the years take their toll in your bitter wings, before your vision dims and the world blurs, and the wintry years keep you close to the fire. In the old age, Your body no longer serves you so well. Muscles slacken, (coughs) grip weakens, joints stiffen. The shades are pulled down on the world. 
You can't come and go at will. Things grind to a halt. The hum of the household fades away. You are awakened now by bird song. Hikes to the mountains are a thing of the past. Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. Your hair turns out of blossom white, adorning a fragile and impotent matchstick body. Yes, you're well on your way to eternal rest while your friends make plans for your funeral. Life, lovely while it lasts, is soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful, ends. The body is put back in the same ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who first breathed it. It's all smoke, nothing but smoke. The quester says that everything's smoke. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1941, Orson Welles directed, co-wrote, and starred in the movie Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane is often listed as one of, if not the, greatest movie of all time. And Orson was only 25 years old when Citizen Kane was released. Now, you would be forgiven for thinking that kind of success right out of the gate would have punched Orson's ticket for the rest of the career, for the rest of his career. If you know about Orson, though, you know that's just not true, don't you? In fact, Orson called Citizen Kane his greatest curse. His greatest curse. After all, how can you ever live up to near perfection again? And it wasn't even just Orson who put this pressure on himself. Hollywood was happy to pile on to. Orson was indulged as long as his movies brought in profits. But when that prospect was threatened, so was the industry. By the end of his career, Orson was financing his films himself. Often his own movies would have to take the back seat while he went off to act in someone else's movies. In 1969, this is over 25 years after Citizen Kane, Peter Bogdanovich interviewed Orson Welles. Peter was interviewing Orson for a book on Orson's filmography. Peter, though, Peter was a budding director himself. And for Peter, those interviews were more than just interviews. They were access to the, the mind of a true artist. Curiously, Peter's own career would have similar trajectories to Orson's. Two years after that interview, in 1971, when Peter was just 32, although he said he was 27, either way, just two years after that interview, Peter would go on to direct the film The Last Picture Show. Uh, the Last Picture Show features Jeff Bridges and Sybil Shepard, and you may know that the movie is extremely well regarded. When the reviews for The Last Picture Show came out, Paul Zimmerman of Newsweek said, The Last Picture Show was the best film by a young American director since, you guessed it, Citizen Kane. Unfortunately, though, just like Orson, Peter, too, would have trouble uh, maintaining his initial success. By the time of his death, Peter had directed certified flops himself, and he, too, was unable to complete a passion project of his own, a movie that he called Wait For Me, a story inspired by a romance of his that was cut short by a tragic death. Of course, there was no way that, that Peter could have known all of that way back in 1969. He was just an up-and-coming director back then. 
picking a veteran's brain. For Orson, though, who was in his 50s, the writing was on the wall. Orson's career was stalling by then. And, and Peter, he must have noticed it too. At one point in the interview, Peter mentioned another seasoned director, John Ford. You may remember I mentioned John Ford a few weeks ago. I know, of course, that you hang on every word of these sermons, don't you? Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, John directed that classic Western featuring John Wayne, The Searchers. That's the one we talked about. And during those interviews, Peter mentioned that older directors like John Ford weren't getting as much work anymore. It wasn't until a day later when Orson brought that comment back up and he said he thought it was a shame. Uh, Orson mentioned orchestral directors and noted how many of them don't get great until they are 75 or older. And then Orson said, I believe Ford today would give us better pictures than, than he has ever made. Next, Orson added, it's only in your 20s and in your 70s and in your 80s that you do your greatest work. It's in youth and old age that the greats are done. It's in youth and old age that the greats are done. But this is not the way we tend to think about it, is it? We tend to think that once you're past your 50, you're past your prime. You're over the hill, as we say. And maybe so. Maybe so. However, as far as the great Orson Welles is concerned, it's not until you think until you're over the hill that you're any good. We think climbing the hill is the prime time, but in Orson's timeline, the hill is merely the intermission between the really good stuff. Well, I don't want to compare myself to Orson Welles, but I became a pastor when I was only 27, you know. And I'm not saying that you're a film, but let me tell you, you are much more marvelous than any movie. And what happens in church is much more thrilling than any summer blockbuster too. Plus, if I do say so myself, you all are much more entertaining too. You can take that however you like. Unlike Orson though, I didn't set the bar too high for myself at my debut. I know, I know, you think I can do no wrong. <laughs> but I'm just like you, you know. I put my slacks on one leg at a time just like everyone else. All right, I hope you can tell I'm joking. But I do mean it that unlike Orson Welles, I haven't had to struggle with being unable to live up to my past. On the contrary, the past has given me plenty to learn from. For instance, I remember sitting with a member, Ben Lundell, during my very first summer here. I'm sure you remember Ben. Well, one day him and I were just chatting in their kitchen and Ben happened to mention that we stand up and sit down too much in the service. And I've got to tell you, that surprised me. After all, I had just come from Gettysburg, and they're quite stuffy about worship over there. Not only do you stand up and sit down multiple times in the service, you also kneel and bow and cross yourself too. It took me a while, but eventually I realized what Ben was trying to tell me. He was just trying to say that he had trouble standing up once he had sat down. And when I realized that's what he was talking about, I didn't worry too much about it. I never even brought it back up to Ben. After all, Ben didn't have to stand, did he? No, you can stay seated throughout the service. And that's true. If you ever join us for worship at 10 a.m. at Unity Lutheran on Sunnyside and your joints are stiff, you don't have to stand. You can stay seated. Trust me, you are still participating. In fact, you might even be participating more than the rest of us. You might even be participating more than the rest of us. 
Now that's the insight I didn't have to share with Ben back then. It would take me a while before I would realize that. At the time, I took sitting down and standing up mostly for granted. And I pretty much still do too, thankfully. But do you know what I've learned not to take for granted since then? This, what's happening with you on the other side of this screen. Over the years, I have realized how humbling it is to stay seated when everyone else stands or to have to worship from home when everyone else comes to the church service, for that matter. And that is not all I've realized. I've also realized that it's easy to just go through the motions when it's easy to just go through the motions, isn't it? But sometimes, sometimes when you can't go through the motions, the motions, they just go right through you, don't they? In our service, we stand to honor Christ, but Christ, he is a humble king, isn't he? Christ's honor is an upside-down kind of honor. When Christ triumphantly entered Jerusalem, he didn't ride a stately stallion, did he? No, he rode a donkey. A donkey. A donkey is a working animal. Christ did not come to be served. No, he came to serve. Christ does not need you or me standing to give him honor. Quite the opposite. You honor Christ when you trust him. And when you insist on standing on your own, you act as if Christ cannot be trusted to carry you. Martin Luther called that self-serving piety the highest act of disrespect. You honor Christ when you treat him as he has promised to be for you. You honor Christ when you trust him to deliver you. And tell me, what's a greater act of trust? Is it relying on your own legs to hoist your bottom off the pew? Or is it trusting that Christ will not look past you when you can't raise yourself to meet his eye line? That's a rhetorical question, isn't it? We all know the answer. Yet for all our knowledge, it is still hard to trust when we have trouble doing for ourselves, isn't it? Nevertheless, you should know that you can trust you truly honor Christ when you rise to welcome him by staying seated and lifting your heart in faith to the one who promises to raise you up on the last day. And that, believe it or not, is all today's passage is about too. Today's passage is the conclusion to Ecclesiastes. And I've had a lot of fun with this unusual book. I hope you have too. But here, at the end, the quester turns his attention to the end. Well, not the end. He turns his attention to our end. As you can tell, today's passage is about old age. And as you'd expect, it's quite candid. If I'm honest, this is probably the hardest part of Ecclesiastes for me. It hits close to home. Its frank depiction of aging seems accurate but that just makes it harder to hear. I know we are all getting older, but I'll be honest, I don't want to think of any of you dying. I know some of you must have noticed this too. You'll, you'll mention your funeral to me and I'll kind of wince or, or I'll just change the subject entirely. I know I shouldn't, but I know I shouldn't, but I don't like to think about your death. And to be honest, we will handle that when the time comes anyway. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, we'll handle that when the time comes. And so, until then, I don't want to think about your death while you're still living. But that said, you should know you can always come to me if you want to talk about death, yours or anyone else's. And many of you already know this. Plenty of you have, have met with me to talk about grief or to plan funeral stuff. And so, so no, you can, you can truly come to me to talk about death anytime. I'll survive. And uh, we have Stephen ministers if you want to talk with someone in the congregation about this. Stephen ministers are people who have been, been trained. And these folks, they've, they've been trained and they know how to, to journey with you through grief. They understand that, that you don't need someone giving you answers. You just need someone to walk alongside you, to listen and pray with you. 
And we have Stephen Ministers and you can make an appointment with one. That's very easy. But of course, we don't avail ourselves of that kind of help, well, well, until later in life most often, don't we? Because those tough parts of life, they don't really tend to come until you have more than a little experience with life, don't they? It's not until you start to feel your own mortality that the sting of death really burns. And it's not until you've had lifelong friendships that the tragedy of death really sinks in. And many of you know that's just the tip of the iceberg too, don't you? It's not until a stroll down the road has its terrors that you begin to fear, face your fears on a daily basis. And it's not until you can't stand that you dare to take your stand on Christ alone. It's not until your youth fails you that you begin to sing, Savior, help me bear life's pain and sorrow. Tell in glory I behold your face. And it's not until life's pain and sorrow really drive you to your knees that you learn that it's not romantic, is it? No, it's just plain hard. Darn hard. And that's putting it politely too, isn't it? Well, wouldn't you know it, Orson was right, wasn't he? True greatness does take place in your 70s and 80s. The story isn't over when you're over the hill. Truthfully, it's just starting to build. It's like one of our saints right here says, it doesn't get any easier with time. It just gets different. And that different is the stuff epics are made of. In fact, a quirky action movie, Thelma, came out this summer that's all about this very dynamic. Thelma is out right now. You can rent it. It features June Squibb and Richard Roundtree. And it's Richard's last film appearance before his death. If that name sounds familiar, Richard Roundtree, but you can't quite place it, Richard Roundtree played Shaft. <laughs> In a wonderful casting uh, against type, Richard is the cautious one. He is the one who is always warning June Squibb's character to be more careful. June's character, though, struggles with the rest of the world treating her as if she's already gone now that she's in her 80s. Thelma, the movie, is just great. The director gives the challenges of aging the full Hollywood treatment of a James Bond or Mission Impossible movie. And you know what? So does today's passage. So does today's passage. Well, not the Hollywood treatment, because this isn't Hollywood, is it? No, this is real life. And the Bible is all about real life. It's as we like to say, true spirituality is life where? Did you say reality? I hope so, because that's right. True spirituality is life in reality. True spirituality is life in reality. And as we said, today's passage is about aging. And yes, the depiction is frank, but you know what else it is? It is also poetic. That's right, poetic. For all of Ecclesiastes, the quester has been has been exact and plain spoken, but here at the end, suddenly it all turns poetic. And you know what? That's not a dodge. It's daring. It's daring. Our translation that we heard from, it, it explains the poetry. And that is fine. But as you know, sometimes the poetry of poetry is more accurate. And as such, I'd like to read from the NRSV. That's the translation we usually use. And specifically, I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 12.6. If you've got your Bible there, you can open it up and follow along. It goes like this. Before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken and the, the pitcher broken at the fountain and the wheel broken at the cistern, Whatever else our death may be, the quester tells us that it is not an unmitigated disaster, doesn't he? Somehow it is even poetic. And as, and as you may know, as dastardly as death is, and it is dastardly, it is also strangely mysterious too, isn't it? Ecclesiastes seeks an unvarnished look at reality. The quester doesn't allow himself the luxury of faith but he does show his hand. Although Ecclesiastes never uses God's personal name, Yahweh, 
the quester does allow himself one religious concept, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord is something that gives us modern people fits. <laughs> we want our gods to be as accessible as Amazon.com and as tame as Target too. And I'll leave it to you to decide if those gods are even worth worshiping. However, I have trouble believing those sorts of gods would bother to become human and die for you and me. And, and I find it even more difficult to believe that they, those gods would go out of, their, out of their way to infuse our lives with God's own sacredness too. Regardless, you ought to know that, that when you fear the Lord, you no longer have anything else to fear. The fear of the Lord creates its opposite. When you fear the Lord, there's nothing else to fear. And that includes death. Yes, death. Why, that even includes all those tenuous steps toward our own final days. In the Four Quartets, a poem, T.S. Eliot said, Old men should be explorers. Old men should be explorers. And we will have to forgive Mr. Eliot for his language, but we should thank him for his verve. Were death the end, Mr. Eliot would be a fool. But seen as Christ has made our death the beginning of our new life, defined by his victory over death, Mr. Eliot is offering nothing less than sage advice. In Christ, you truly have nothing else to fear. And that makes everything else an absolute adventure. Yes, of course, there will be tears and heartache. But there will be comfort and joy, too. But through it all is the one who doesn't go around death. Through it all is the one who goes right through death, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, your good shepherd. Jesus Christ, the one who makes you lie down in green pastures. Jesus Christ, the one who leads you beside still waters. Jesus Christ, the one who restores your soul. Jesus Christ, the one who leads you in paths of righteousness, all for his name's sake. Now it is all territory for you to explore and not play acting either. No, God has come to give you the real deal. Heaven and earth, the beginning and the end. In Christ, it all lies wide open before you. Maybe the hill is still ahead of you. Or maybe you're in the middle of climbing it, or maybe the hill is well behind you. Either way, Christ isn't close to done with you, not by a long shot. You don't age out of faith. It just gets different. And yes, that different can be daunting. But as Christ's mercy are new every morning, including this one, it's now promising. And it's all yours for good measure, too. So I guess the only question is, the only question is, what are you waiting for? <laughs> what are you waiting for? And so, to get started, we're going to do something totally daring. Lift our humble voices all the way to heaven. Because on account of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's something you can do. The service will continue with some time for you to pray, and then you'll be invited to join the prayers of the church and even the praise of the church. Blessing.
And now, be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And indeed, that's what we'll do. We'll have a little bit of time, too, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice. children say, Amen. Amen. And so now as we prepare to conclude this service, um, there's always plenty going on this summer. We've got a few big uh, studies that we're excited about. There's always Bible study. We've got activities for the youth. And a very fine way to check that out is to join us here for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. or um, check out our website and at the end of the service it'll have our website and you could shoot us a message from our email which our website lists or check us out on social media and send us a message that way or give us a call we'd love to be in chat those are the best ways to find out what's happening in real time but now now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit let us pray as Jesus taught us our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so now... Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>